Okay, so in part two of this week's content, I'm going to talk mostly about the work of Zygmunt Bauman, a very prominent uh, sociologist um, who died a couple of years ago, unfortunately, who uh, lived a pretty amazing life, um, uh, ended up settling in Leeds, um, and really kind of in the last 20 years, almost after he retired, becoming ridiculously productive. Mm. Cynic might say wrote a lot of books, was a really good publishing powerhouse in many ways for Polity Press, but like... I would highly recommend most of those books to as introductory readings to uh, various issues because Bauman is such a beautiful writer. Mm. Um, manages to bring many different sociological, theoretical and conceptual perspectives together in a really eloquent way um, and also to create his own kind of conceptual things as well. Um, so I think I'm recommending Bauman as a kind of, you know, nice way to introduce yourself to kind of, uh, I think, uh, sociological analyses that are kind of quite readable mm. um, that are also theoretically informed but not like theoretically dense mm. Um, mm. so uh, Bauman's got a bunch of really interesting books that, um, that I'll just touch upon some of them here Bauman's kind of big um, thing that where he came to the fore was the idea where he wrote about um, uh, liquid modernity this is often put in the same genre as uh, Ulrich Beck's work on risk society and Giddens' stuff on modernity and self-identity um, again the notion that Western societies in particular being individualised, we're becoming more and more reflexive. There's de-traditionalisation processes and these are having profound effects on the way that uh, we live and relate and think and feel. The liquid here is a relation to the famous Marx quote of all that's solid melts into air in terms of that kind of historical materialism. Um, Bauman argues we're kind of stuck somewhere between that solid and air, constant in this state of liquidity, a metaphor for the demand of flexibility in all aspects of life and the growing role of consumerism. In terms of all those production and consumption relations that we've been talking about throughout this whole course, Bauman argues that we're pretty much all today living in this permanent sense of impermanence. Mm. Um, I suppose one way to think about it is, you know, you don't just kind of go through a kind of school and growing up as a young person, you get this job and then you're at that job for the rest of your life and you settle down and that's not really how people live anymore. They're mm. kind of constantly demanded to kind of, you know, change careers or get more mm. training or, you know, move around and all that kind of thing. And our aspirations have been reshaped to want that. Yeah, too. yeah. You know, that we don't, right. sit, we don't want to live in the small yeah. town where we grew up. We want to go somewhere yeah. bigger, somewhere better. This kind of constant chasing of better, 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 yeah, better, yeah, better that's right. also fuels that too. So this kind of permanent sense of impermanence for Bauman, kind of, it's, it's something that does cross a, across class lines, mm. even the kind of privilege experience this as well. And moving around is a privilege. Mm. You know, if you've got the right passport and you have the right skin colour, it's much easier than if you don't have those things. But for those kind of at the pointy end of globalisation that we've been talking about, the ground has kind of been shifted at it between their feet. You know, they're forced to move around the world in some ways. There's kind of those push-pull factors of mobility that, um, you know, you, um, you look at when you look at things like immigration and, and refugee stuff kind of permanent sense of impermanence but nowhere left to go for, mm. for those kind of people so again you can see uh, Bauman is quite literary when he wants to kind of write about this stuff so this, there's quite a bit of kind of almost Frankfurt School-esque cultural dupism I think in some of the things that Bauman says even though he doesn't really endorse that perspective and when talking about the rise of consumer culture as a kind of way of life talks about how goods and services, these things must arouse desires in us. Mm. Um, they need to seduce us in all that kind of ways that people like the Franklin School and even Baudrillard spoke about. Um, but we can never be satisfied. Because mm. if you're satisfied, the whole thing stops. We stop buying. So yeah. really there's this constant desire that's created by the, you know, the various kind of culture industries to buy more stuff. But Bauman says we must want to be seduced in some ways as well. It's not like we're completely cultural dupes. It must express mm. something of us that we're, you know, intrigued or, um, you know, want to, you know, buy a pair of Air Jordans or whatever. Mm. Um, so he's kind of pointing to false consciousness here. There's an impossibility today in the West in particular to live your life as anything but a consumer in some ways. Mm. And I suppose even the politics of opting out and I don't mm. moving and living in a tent in the middle of mm. nowhere or something is still in relation to that. Yes. Um, so this... In this sense, consumer culture pr creates desire, but not satisfaction is a key thing that he's talking about. But part of this, Bauman argues, is that people are now consumer products themselves. Mm. 
he talks about how consumerism has kind of consumed life. And now people themselves increasingly think of themselves as products or maybe more accurately as brands. We mm. kind of need to brand ourselves in various aspects of our lives. So I've got a long quote there. I won't uh, read that one out too much. But like what he's talking about here is I suppose there's always been demands to brand ourselves and sell ourselves in some respects, whether that's, you know, to get a job in a job mm. interview or you kind of do it to, you know, to maybe have a partner and mm. someone you're attracted to or whatever. But what Bauman's talking about here is this increasing demand for us to kind of inhabit these spaces to perform a version of ourselves that's promotive or performative um, in a way that's very much central to how consumer capitalism works. And this is particularly the case with the digital realm. Mm. So, you know, it's a little bit dated now. He's largely talking about things like MySpace and Facebook and particularly the rise of reality TV shows kind of post the year 2000. But, you know... This is, if anything, become more ubiquitous. Yes, and we talked about it too in, in the week on connectivity, not just you know where we consume things, how we consume them, but what we consume, consuming the lives of others, the yeah. influence they have, and then we also, in turn, replicate right. that. In yeah, lots of yeah. so ways. the idea of consuming life here is not just the way that consumption consumes our own life, but the way we consume others, people's lives, the way we click and watch that stuff over others, and this all becomes part of the way that consumer capitalism functions and creates uh, mm. value. Yeah. What Bauman, Bauman constructs as a way of thinking about these broad globalizations is the kind of class relationship, what he calls the tourist and vagabond. Now, before I even start talking about this, this is, these things are massively overgeneralized. Um, so we could easily pick apart these categories and say that, you know, what about these people in the middle or whatever? That's not really the point of what he's kind of get across here. He's not trying to promote some kind of accurate class system mm. where we can kind of say that these people do this and these people do that, or these people have this much and these people have that much. What he's more talking about here, I suppose, is an imaginary um, in terms of the way people think about themselves, think about them other, them others, but also in relation to notions of freedom about particularly around movement. Mm. So that's, again, why the kind of terms tourist and vagabond work quite well here. He argues that the, there's levels of kind of difference in the world that the t tourist and vagabond kind of know about don't experience and therefore can't really imagine or even understand each other. This kind of mm. so different. Um, for the tourist and vagabond, time and space mean very different things, even though they may be moving around the world. But this globalization consumer culture practices are very much about satisfying the global tourists' kind of dreams and desires. This puts the vagabond in the position of service, of exploitation, of largest kind of, you know, satisfying those desires, or at least trying to, to do that. Again, the vagabond here very much relates to those kind of necropolitics and gore capitalism relations. The tourist almost ironically spectates what's going on in, in that sense as well, if you we were relating to that earlier in the course. So, again, I've got, I've got a few more quotes there, but like I think the less appetising the vagabond's fate, the more savoury the tourist's existence. The vagabond is a tourist's nightmare while the tourist is the vag vagabond's dream. Mm. Very much here talking about kind of those global relations again. So other other kind of sociologists have had ways of dealing with this as well. I think Castell's version of it with the networker, mm. the networked and the switched off, mm. I think is a good way of thinking about it. But I'll also say here, like in terms of these kind of, you know, the gore capitalism re relations, I mean, you could even argue that me using some of these photos of the refugees in the person in the refugee camp here is a version of it like mm. we're kind of almost doing a bit of this mm. in the way that we're teaching this course because we're tourists and mm. we're completely almost disconnected from the vagabond in that sense so you know your work in particular is kind of engaged much more closely with this but in the end um you know here we are in our mm. western comfortable university almost kind of using the lives of these people as a not a metaphor but like a representation of kind of um understanding the problems but like we're very much immersed in those relations mm. rather than kind of doing that much about them so i'm not trying to kind of cop out there mm. but I, I really want to kind of emphasize that i think academics are tourists mm. in that sense just as much as like mm. you know the ceo or the um you know the professional sports person or the um fashion designer or the celebrity in that sense we're not they have the same cultural economic power but we're in terms of these relations um, much, I think, of the activities that goes around these things positions the researcher, even though we're fundamentally concerned about them, in that kind of Taurus camp. 
Importantly for Bauman, um, this polarisation of the world that's happening isn't just kind of alien or kind of, you know, some kind of misstep. It's actually the effect of globalisation as well. So economic growth actually exacerbates poverty in this sense. It feeds more consumer wonders for the tourist and leaves the vagabond kind of something to be enchanted by but also to work for. So, Bellman then, you know, talks again extending, I think, uh, these kind of necropolitics and gore capitalism understandings, although uh, some of this kind of came before those concepts, so it would be interesting to know mm. who was influenced by who in many ways. Mm. Um, he talks about this idea of wasted life, the human externalities of global consumer c- culture. When I first kind of started thinking about this and reading this, I kind of had a bit of a adverse reaction to the idea of wasted lives. It felt mm. like it, that term itself was almost derogatory to the people mm. that it was kind of describing. But I suppose what Bauman's doing here is kind of getting us to think about the real externalities of this. We've spoken about externalities in the course in terms of economics, you know, pollution and stuff mm. like that, just negative and positive. Um, Bauman wants us to really understand that the way that people in powerless positions, I suppose, are positioned in this sense leaves them in that very much that kind of zombie state that um, Membe talks about with um, necropolitics. So again, there's a, <coughs> a quote there, but like, you know, the production of human waste, or more correctly, wasted humans, excessive redundant, that is the population of those who either could not or were not wish to be recognised or allowed to stay, is an inevitable outcome of modernisation, an inseparable accompaniment of modernity. It is the inescapable side effect of order building. Each order casts some part of the extant population as out of place, unfit, undesirable, and of economic progress that that cannot proceed without degrading and devaluing the previous effective modes of making a living, and therefore cannot but deprive the practitioners of a livelihood. Now, this you know also happens in places like Australia. You know, so as BHP moves its production out of Newcastle, you know, there's a bunch of you know white working class men that had this kind of dignified job that are all of a sudden made redundant. Mm. The term itself, redundant, is a really kind of obvious way of thinking mm. about this kind of wasted life. They're too old to retrain, mm. you know, then they, you know, those, a lot of those men end up with all kinds of health problems and, and things like that. The, you can see this also in terms of the way that politics plays out in Australia and the rise of things like One Nation. Mm. Um, as those people become feeling redundant, they kind of look to the past and want to return to this apparently more secure um, thing. So the wasted lives this, in this sense very much speaks to those broad international relations that we've been talking about, but it also has effects on um, people in industries mm. in the first world, so-called first world as they become you know, moving around as well. I think the visibility of wasted lives always comes into play with international borders, and I think what Balan's talking about here often is refugees, right, and, yep. and migrants who come in formally, etc. But the same dynamics of being... Um, that great word, excessive and redundant, are also felt locally too. You know, mm. South Africa is an interesting country that went through apartheid, it's a horrific kind of separation, it's then become quite a successful economy, and has turned on migrants from other parts of Africa very vociferously, yep. including much of the, the population yep. affected by apartheid. Um, and, and very similarly, excessive and redundant people are sent back to Zimbabwe, yeah. Malawi, etc., etc., and Nigeria in particular, because there's an easy passage between the two. So I think what's fascinating about this kind of distinction is, is how it manifests so much in different capacities, you know, from, from Newcastle to South Africa yeah. to, um, to, to other places. I mean, everywhere, it's, it's this kind of, I think, what's great about that liquid metaphor is that it's, it's a very relative, um, it's a very kind of relative distinction that, that everywhere has its uh, wasted lives, in mm. that sense. Yeah, yeah, every, yeah. Every place has its wasted lives, and the more movement between the two, the more it amplifies um, and the more movement, so I guess around the world, the more it amplifies. So I think it's a wonderful way of thinking about um, inclusion and exclusion, yep. uh, um, you know, affluence and violence in almost any context. Mm. And I think that's why it's become such a powerful and useful yeah. concept. And I think it, like we can only extend it to thinking about things like local quant's work about advanced marginality in global cities, like around mm. what's what's called ghettos and stuff like that. So, and I think what's important, I think, to consider about in terms of if we're thinking about a category of wasted lives, is that people that it's people that are exposed to those forms of violence that mm. I was talking about yeah. more uh, earlier on. People are exposed to symbolic and particularly physical violence and how that's kind of resultant of the 
uh, the norms of this kind of system mm. that we're in. So it's systemic violence at all. Unpack more in the last part of the lecture. Uh, more recently, uh, there was uh, those huge uh, riots on the streets of London, um, I think in 2012. Bauman had a lot of interesting things to say about that as well in terms of consumerism. He kind of controversially argued argue that these were as much consumer riots as anything mm. else as kind of exclu in terms of the result of exclusion. He argued that the burning down of shops, for instance, mm. isn't just like, you know, looting and isn't just people like necessarily like going in to steal the things they want. It becomes a kind of broader symbol of the way that kind of even people in a global city like London are seen as defective consumers because, you know, they're poor or they're chavs or mm. they're unemployed or whatever and they're kind of pushed out of what it means to be a legitimate citizen. And then things like violence that spring up like this, for Bauman, are almost legitimate expressions of that kind of inequality and that mm. kind of constant bombardment of systemic violence that people in disadvantaged positions experience. Um, if you're interested in that, I do a whole lecture on riots in, the, in a course called Soccer 1050, which is called Youth, Health and Crime. It might be changing its name to Youth, Crime and Gender. So um, if you're interested in that, you can kind of do that so you can see that there. And I've got some um, links to Bauman writing about that in some kind of um, magazines in the UK. Okay, so I'm going to leave the work of Bauman there. I think Bauman's, again, as I said, a nice way to kind of introduce yourself to social theory. Uh, it tends to be a, a kind of nice writer in that sense and understandable um, and has some um, interesting things to say about many of the things we've been looking at throughout the course.